Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for today's Thought Leader Conversation on Readiness. Today's conversation is a part of a regular series of explorations of the key questions of what does it mean for all young people to be ready for life's demands at every stage, and what's it going to take to get there? Karen Pittman, the CEO of the Forum for Youth Investment, leads lively and candid conversations with some of the most influential boundary-pushing leaders working to improve the lives of children and young people across the U.S. Today's session will feature Bridget Laird and Nicole Lavecchio, both with Wings for Kids, the only evidence-based SEL program designed specifically for after school. The conversation will focus on the power of social and emotional learning, both for young people and the adults who work with them. A little bit about our presenters. Karen Pittman is president and CEO of the Forum for Youth Investment and a respected sociologist and leader in youth development. Prior to co-founding the Forum in 1998, she launched adolescent pregnancy prevention initiatives at the Children's Defense Fund, started the Center for Youth Development and Policy Research, and served as Senior Vice President at the International Youth Foundation. Bridget Laird is CEO of Wings for Kids, where she has worked since 1998. As a former Chief Program Officer and a Site Supervisor, Bridget has experience in all areas of nonprofit management. Bridget was instrumental in developing the Wings Theory, for theory of Change, oversaw the local replication of Wings within Charleston, and led the out-of-state expansion in Georgia and North Carolina. Nicole Lavecchio, Chief Program Officer with WINGS, has spent the last 17 years creating, implementing, evaluating, and delivering the WINGS for Kids curriculum. Before WINGS, she counseled youth and their families during two years at the South Carolina Department of Mental Health. There are only a handful of slides for today's session. We will be accepting questions and comments via the chat feature, which is available at the top or the bottom of your screen. Today's session is being recorded and it will be sent to everyone who registered for today's session and also posted to the Ready by 21 website along with any uh, resources or links that are mentioned during the session. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Ian. Um, and Bridget and Nicole, welcome. I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Um, I had the pleasure of being uh, with you a couple months ago uh, when you were releasing uh, some of the early findings uh, from uh, the studies that you've been doing. Um, and so I'm glad that we're going to be able to share that with even more folks um, on the call. So let's let's start out with, um, for those people who don't know what WINGS is, let's start out with a brief description. Um, we're always challenged here at the forum to have people practice their elevator speech. What's your elevator speech for WINGS? Yeah, sure. And well, thank you very much, Karen. We're happy to be here, too. Um, so WINGS for Kids is actually 21 years old, and from our beginning, we have been about social and emotional learning. Our founder found herself in a place in life where she was having challenges and sort of getting to a place where she wanted to find more success within her life, and she thought to herself, I'm missing a set of skills, and I'm not quite sure what those skills are, and at the same time, the book Emotional Intelligence by Dan Goldman had come out. And she said, you know, those are the skills that I feel as if I'm missing. So I'm going to make it my mission to get those skills to kids at as young as age as we can so that when they get to be my age, they won't have the struggles and challenges that I've had. So we developed Wings for Kids, which is all about bringing social and emotional skills to kids. We do that through an after-school program that is for grades K through 5, so elementary schools. And we deliver it in Title I low-income low schools. We have a very codified, structured program that has a curriculum, learning objectives, and um, very specific training. And we've worked on the fidelity of the program over the years. We've been delivering this in after-school programs in the Southeast. So we were located in Charleston, South Carolina, had our original programs there. And then we replicated to Atlanta, Georgia, and Charlotte, North Carolina. And so we have been in the after school space infusing social and emotional learning essentially from our birth. Good. Well, that was a long elevator ride, but it was a great um, introduction to, uh, to, to what um, you all are up to. And I had not heard the, uh, the, the origin uh, linking it back to the, uh, the book on emotional intelligence. So that's that's really good. That sort of answered my second question of, of why you all decided to start Wings. That's a very clear, um, it's a very clear explanation, and you certainly have been true to that, true to that mission. Um, I want to get you to talk a little bit about um, why you went into 
uh, thinking about a random controlled trial study, but it might be useful before that um, to walk us through a little bit more about the program. You, you described it as uh, a very codified program that you have been sort of tweaking um, um, over the last, uh, last 20 years, and I know you have a slide on what the uh, sort of what the after school model is. So I'll get Ian to shift to that slide and maybe you can just walk us through how you all ended up with this, this codified program. Sounds good. I'm actually going to pass that over to Nicole to answer that question. So okay. here's Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, Karen. Thank you. So our model um, is pretty unique for after school in regards to the fact that we um, require kids to attend five days per week for the full three hours a day. And that was part of our um, thoughts around making sure our kids received the curriculum we were providing. So we put that into place and, and tried to track the number of kids coming and how often they were there and, and what curriculum they were getting while in the program. Um, we also have a model where we use college students as our part-time mentors, and we spend a lot of time on training them before they even have any contact with students. We spend right around 40 hours with them training on leadership skills, working with kids in poverty, dealing with kids who have been um, affected by trauma, just a lot of big picture um, training. And then we spend another 40, another 20 hours, I'm sorry, for a total of 60, um, working on training them on our components of the day and how to run our after school program. We have a very low um, ratio of adults to students. We do one to 12. So the kids have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with their leader and they become a group bonded together as a family and they really get to build those strong relationships with their college mentor. Um, our program is really centered around our WINGS creed, and our creed is the five social emotional skills put into kid-friendly language. So we have lessons in there around self-awareness and loving who you are. We have um, things around uh, working together for relationship skills, understanding others are unique to teach them about social awareness. So no kid in our program is going to say, oh, we're focusing on our social awareness today. They would talk about how others, it's okay to be different and how they should accept everyone and try to step into the shoes of other people that they meet. So almost everything we do in our program centers around the Wings Creed. We have 10 learning objectives pulled from the Wings Creed and we focus on them in trimesters. So each objective has a focus three times a year. And that helps us for our transient population where we have new kids coming to the school all throughout the year. They don't miss out on any lessons if we're teaching them in trimester periods. All the games we do with kids um, circle around the lessons from the creed and our learning objectives. And we have intentional teaching where we are doing um, discussions and um, we're doing discussions with them and um, specific games focused around the social emotional skill building. But we also then have most of our teaching is done by implicitly through real life teachable moments. So two kids pushing each other at the water fountain, we talk about being kind and caring to each other. Or let's say those kids are making a mess at the water fountain, we talk about stepping into the shoes of the custodial staff who would have to come through and clean up that mess. So while we have that intentional explicit teaching, we also have a lot of implicit teaching going on through teachable moments. And we operate on a three block structure with um, community unity being the biggest part of our day, the most important part of our day. That's where we have our wings wide group where we have a lot of bonding going on, where we have intentional skill building through social and emotional lessons. Then we have an academic center block where kids work on homework and then also do STEM-based stations. And during academic center, we focus a lot on self-management, the skill of self-management with being able to focus and being able to um, ask for help if you need it. And then we have another block of time for enrichment, which is where we'll bring in community-based partners to help work on a skill set um, in a fun way with the students. 
Great. Thanks for walking through that. I mean, and when you say that the 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 community unity is the biggest part, is that two of the three hours, an hour and a half of the three hours? What? How much time is that? It's an hour. It's an hour of the day. So each of the blocks is right around you know 50 minutes to an hour and community okay. unity i would say is our most structured block where we have specific we have a welcome we have a handshake that we do we have lessons that we incorporate we have bonding time for the kids so we have a lot built into that one hour block of time great so this is an extremely as you said it's an extremely codified uh program um and one that um, requires young people uh, to, to come five days a week. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of these things were done. Uh, well, let me just ask the question. Did you set it up in this way with the expectation that you were going to do a random control trial? Were you really trying to uh, sort of, you've met most of the criteria in terms of really having this specified and locked down and having students participate five days a week? Um, was that your anticipation from the beginning that you wanted to prepare for doing a random control trial study? Not from the beginning of WING, but yes, when we um, worked and started talking about doing a randomized control trial, we had to put some things in place. Um, up until then, it, what, there were times where kids were leaving at 3 o'clock or, you know, coming at 2.30, leaving at 3.30, and we saw those as, you know, problems for being able to implement a randomized control trial. So we did have to set some parameters around things like attendance and dosage and even just the structure of our components, how long the components had to be, um, what needed to be done in them, because we wanted everything to be the same, especially as we were replicating and looking to start the randomized control trial. Yeah, and also to add to that, I think what helped us um, think about the randomized control trial is when we, we got pretty serious about developing a theory of change. So we had operated our program for a good bit, seven or eight years, where we were doing some research and partnering with some research institutes, but not really setting our goals for what it was that we wanted to achieve with the kids. We were sort of just casting a wide net and seeing what positive results came with the kids, as opposed to saying, this is what the outcomes that we want to achieve with the kids, and this is how we want to get there. So once we established that theory of change, then we were able to say, okay, now let's get on the path for randomized control trial because we want to see if what we've hypothesized in this theory of change is in fact true. And how do you describe the theory of change? What, is, what, what are the things that you think are critical for getting to this set of skill growth? So we, what we did was we looked at what it is that, so, what we provided and then we looked at short-term outcomes and then long-term outcomes and we made the assumption that if kids came for two years four or five days a week three hours a day so a full intense dosage of the program delivered in the way that we had established then we thought that their short-term outcomes would that they'd be they'd have knowledge of social and emotional skills then they would begin to dis display the social and emotional skills in school and at home they would also become more attached to school. And then the long-term outcomes, which we took research to back into this, is that they would graduate more frequently, avoid teenage pregnancy, and avoid jail. So kind of holding ourselves accountable for the short-term, measuring those with our internal performance management system, checking those against the randomized control trial, and hoping with the hope and expectation that the long-term outcomes will be achieved. Great. Um, well, that's, you know, that's a huge amount of work and a huge amount of discipline. Um, I'm just curious, as you, as you move to this, this stricter uh, requirements, did you have pushback from parents? Was it hard to recruit um, from families that, where you had the requirement that the kid had to come five days, three hours? Um, I would say that at the beginning, we did have a little pushback. But we also target um, schools that serve an at-risk population. And a lot of the students that we're dealing with don't have the opportunities to participate in any other extracurricular um, activities, which is why we try to bring in some external partners for our enrichment time where they can participate in the City Rec Basketball League. Um, and then they can do that while they're in the WINGS program. <clears throat> 
So after probably, I would say the first year, we didn't get a lot of pushback from parents. A lot of the parents really appreciated that the kids had a safe place to be after school five days a week. Okay. Um, let, I see questions already coming in, so let me turn to Ian and see what's coming in through the screen. So one of the questions that Karen asked was actually, someone else uh, asked, you know, is this, was there pushback from parents if kids weren't able to play sports or band or uh, participate in other activities, which I think you uh, answered very well. Um, some kind of logistics questions. What it, is there a cost to families uh, to participate in the program? There is no cost to the families to participate. We fundraise for what it costs to run a program so that the parents are not charged a fee for our program. And then a second question, how do students respond to receiving the same material multiple times during a year if you're doing a trimester rotation pattern? So what we do is we've layered the material. So the first time they get it, the first 10 weeks of the program, it's a bit pretty broad overview. So it might be something around um, learning to um, own your mistakes. And then um, we would spend time on that. And then during the second trimester, there would be more around the word accountability and how to take accountability for your actions and how to um, think before acting to think about what the consequence might be afterwards. And then the third trimester, we would dive deeper into when taking accountability for something, how you can make amends with others. So it's not, it's the same lesson with just added information each time. And just to add, um, one of the reasons we actually used to have 30 learning objectives and we would implement one learning objective per week throughout the course of the year. And with our randomized control trial, we had in, an implementation study that ran next to it. So as we were doing the randomized control trial, we were looking at the implementation of our program. And we had learned that we were staying too far above. So the kids were getting a little bit of an objective for a week and then having to quickly move on to another objective. And it wasn't, their learning wasn't as intense enough. So we actually adjusted based on some learnings from our implementation study to have the 10 learning objectives delivered in trimesters as opposed to the 30 staying so far above. Um, and so and we also, just for your information, the slide that just came up, this is the creed that Nicole was referring to on the left side. And on the right, you can see that each of our, throughout the day, the children might get some teaching through the creed. So the, the line of the creed is, I love and accept who I am on the inside and know my emotions are nothing to hide. That's a line of the creed that refers to self-awareness. And so the lessons that they have can be um, a variety. And here's just two examples, love and accepting who you are, share your emotions. And then the learning objectives that are associated with that are there at the bottom. So each kind of skill set, each of the five competencies has a line of the creed, some lessons that the children get, and then learning objectives that are reinforced. And again, we have that for all five competencies, and we do um, focus our curriculum around the five castle skill set competencies. So we do self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Great. Let me see if there are any other questions on, on uh just how WINGS works, and then we'll get you to talk a little bit about the uh, evaluation. Yeah, I think there are a few more, and just as a, another reminder, please keep the questions coming, and also, yes, today's session is being recorded and will be shared with everyone probably Monday or Tuesday of next week. Uh, there's several really good questions in here that I think, uh, from what I understand, the conversation is going to address those in terms of you know, what uh, SEL skills do adults need and kind of, you know, what are some lessons learned for other types of programs? So I'll, I'll turn it okay. back over to Good. the conversation. All right, so let's go into uh, learning a little bit more about how you set the, uh, the randomized controlled trial up and then even more important, what you learn from it and from the implementation study as well. Um, and then we can start to talk about how to bring some of the lessons out of that uh, that uh, folks can use in their program. Um, so would you like us to go to the randomized control Profile slide and let you get started? Sure, that sounds good. All right. 
So just to give you some logistics around the randomized control trial, it was conducted through the University of Virginia, and the University of Virginia received a grant from the U.S. Department of Education, and it was from the Institute for Educational Science. Um, and they received an initial grant to implement this randomized control trial. We also received a second grant over the course of the RCT from, um, we were selected for the, a grant from the Social Innovation Fund through the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation. And that added to the study and also allowed us to do the full implementation piece. It was a very serious study in terms of the amount of people that were focused and thinking about this every day. We were also partnered with the College of Charleston, which is right down the road from our, all of our schools. And about eight to nine people from UVA and College of Charleston were thinking about this study every day. And the way that it worked is we had at the time four schools in Charleston. And what we did was we recruited kindergartners. The reason we chose kindergartners was because we had already had a program up and running at all four schools. And so there were many kids within each of the schools that already had some wings. Some kids had been in, some kids had been out. So we needed a fresh batch of kids that never had any wings experience. So we took kindergarten kids at all four schools. We advertised the program to all the people around the neighborhood. So the, the pre-K programs, preschools in the areas, child care in the area to say there's, you know, this wings after school program at the school where your child will attend next year. And people, all the parents applied to get into wings. We then had them all attend a summer camp. And at that summer camp, we did the pre-assessing. So we had um, the kids did some self-assessments. They did um, some observations. We had interviews with the parents and everybody was giving the pre-assessments. Then at the end of the camp, the randomization occurred. So some kids got into wings and some kids did not. And then we followed them throughout the course so that we had our control group and we had our wings group. We had three cohorts. So some kids ended up being in wings for three years and we had a two year and then a one year. The data collected was a wide variety of things. We had child assessments, we had parent interviews, we had teacher interviews, we had child observations. And then finally, as a part of the implementation, we did a lot of fidelity observations to see how the program was being implemented at each of the four sites so that when we were looking at outcomes, we would know, you know, we could make the parallel between outcomes versus the fidelity of the program. One thing that we did learn is that a randomized control trial is a lot of work and it affects the program in a many variety of different ways. It also affected the organization in a variety of different ways. It was probably more challenging than we ever thought it would be. Um, some of the challenges that occurred, uh, the first was the randomization. As I mentioned, they randomized the kids after the summer camp. One of the things that occurred was some of the children between getting randomized into wings they changed the school that they were going to attend in the fall. So they ended up going to schools that there were, there were no WINGS programs. So they had been identified as a WINGS child that never stepped into the WINGS program. But the way that an RCT works is that they were identified as a WINGS kid throughout the entire study. So that was um, an issue. Dosage is also an issue. Um, again, Nicole mentioned it was hard in the beginning to get kids to stop coming and leaving at 3.30. Um, we also had, um, you know, transient rates. When kids left the school, then they didn't have the large dosage traits. So if they had gone to a school that did not have wings, we lost them as a wings kid. And they were, again, still identified as a wings kid, but not going to a wings program. We had a lot of pro program changes over the course of what turned into about five years. Um, we had staff you no know, leave. We also were replicating to Atlanta. So when the randomized control started, we were only in Charleston. But as we replicated to Atlanta, we took some staff and moved to Atlanta. So there were a lot of different program changes. Program locations changed. Some of our schools um, were identified as the buildings were not safe. So the schools moved to about 10 miles up the road, which changed the population of the kids that were coming to the program and also changed the logistics 
um, because it was so far from the home, they, if they came to wings, they weren't getting home until about 7.30 at night. So we lost a lot of kids there. And then obviously, if anyone has done any type of research, missing data becomes a problem. You know, we've had a lot of the control kids moved and we couldn't find them and that type of thing. But with all that being said, from what I've understood from other RCTs, we really did have a pretty nice success rate and that we had a lot of uh, control kids and wing kids participate. We were able to get a lot of parent participation. We were able to learn so much about the program. So at the end of the day, we were extremely happy that we went through the process. I think there are not a lot of after school programs in a place that can go through a full randomized control trial. So we were happy to go through it. And we were also happy to be able to do exactly what we're doing right now, which is share with the field and help others kind of learn and be on this journey with us. Well, if there's uh, anybody on the phone that was thinking about a random control trial, you've probably talked them out of it. Um, but uh, but it, it is impressive that you were able to do it. I mean, how many were in the sample? How many kids did you have in the sample? So it initial, initially, it was in the high 300s, but we ended up with an end closer to about 222. Okay. And then after all that, what, what did you learn? What are the findings? Um, you could advance to the next slide and we can talk a little bit about the findings. And there's quite a bit of interest in getting a copy of the study if possible. That's been a yes. hot topic of questions. Yes, so actually um, we have a lot of different reports circulating um, within the study. We, because it was um, funded through the Corporation for National Service, you can actually go on their website and our, our initial draft report is on that website. Um, again, that's the Corporation for National Service and um, it is on there under the Social Innovation Fund project, so you can go there. But what we did find is that, you know, we went into this without knowing much. And then while we were in the middle of the study, we learned that about 90% of RCTs um, come up with no findings or no results. So we thought to ourselves, wow, we kind of dove into something that we didn't necessarily know what we were getting into. So we were happy at the end to have some statistically significant results. We were also happy to learn about the implementation and also help us design our future based on our learnings. So some of the evidence in the statistically significant stuff was around cognitive development, so executive function skills and self-regulation. We had um, some results there. Also within the academic skill area, the naming vocabulary and letter word ID, we had results around there. And then in classroom behavior, um, closeness and uh, decrease of hyperactivity and bullying. And then the teacher rated measures showed a broad, broad pattern of reduced negative behavior and improved quality of relationships with teachers. So, you know, we are happy with the positive results that have come out. Um, again, it's not very frequent that you do get positive findings within an RCT. We also, I think that almost as important was the parallel implementation that went on next to it. Because I think we learned a lot about the context in which we operate, so the demographics of our schools, and, and just in general, what low-income families go through and how we need to adjust programming to fit their needs. Um, also, the quality of the program operations. We learned a lot about things that we could make our program better and that we could increase the chances of outcomes with kids based on the way that we were delivering the program. And in general, just ways to improve the program model. And at the end of the day, and I'll let Nicole talk a little bit about this, one of the things that I think our implementation study really led the path is understanding that Adult skills are really the key to measuring the child outcomes. We learned so much about the heart of the program really being started with the adults. So those college students that are delivering the program to the kids and also their supervisor who is a full-time program director who is a college graduate. 
finding out how we are training them and how it affected the outcomes that the child uh, in the end had. So I can uh, pass it over to Nicole to talk a little bit more about that. Great. Yeah, so I would say that um, in finding out how important the adults were, I think we always knew that, but it was, we spent a lot of time on curriculum design and how our components should be laid out. And we found out that when looking at four different sites who were running the same exact wings program, you know, there were different factors based on the adults in the program. So that led us to really focus our training on the adults. And I saw some questions come in around how we design that training. And what we ended up doing was creating um, something for our staff to really hold on to a training. So we um, created what we call the set approach, which is support, engage, and teach. So we spend that 40 hours with our staff, working with them on specific ways to support kids, how they can better engage kids, and how they can teach and build the social emotional skills. So as an adult coming in to work with WINGS, you're learning about how to um, talk to kids in a positive tone, how to manage behavior proactively, how to avoid punishment and empower kids to make good choices on their own. So things that, um, you know, some people aren't coming into an after school program thinking they're gonna learn and work on, but we really learned a lot about how the adults affect the climate of the program. We also spend a lot of time working on the five skills with the adults. So we work with them on their own self-awareness, their own relationship skills, their own um, decision-making. And that's something that I would say is throughout our entire organization, that we expect everyone to give and receive feedback. We expect everyone to look at the perspective of others. And so I think um, when we were able to really sit down and focus on um, the adults need to be working on these five skills and, and they have the power to make these programs as strong as they possibly can be. We spend a lot more time um, training them on how to do so. That's great. Uh, and I, I know that you answered some of the questions that were coming up. There are lots of questions coming, so let's pause for a second and see if uh, between you all and Ian, there are other things we want to tackle before we go into talking about replication. So I think you hit on several such as how is SEL reflected in your staff and management practices and how do you train staff. There's some interest in your uh, training of trainers program and we're happy to send that information out uh, after the session or you can do a, a plug if you'd like at the end of today's sessions. A few questions have come in regarding how do you handle staff turnover, especially working with you know uh, college students. How do you how do you deal with that the you know constant influx of new new staff members yeah so that what that is a challenge that we face um, we really try on the front end to incentivize our staff as much as we can to keep them engaged the same things that we're trying to do with the students support and engage them we're trying to do the same thing with our staff so we try to you know be a little proactive that way but you know that's the nature of the field is that we have a we do have some turnover so what we did was we turned our 40 hour pre-training we cut that down to 20 hours and we put some of the material that we cut out um, online with recorded sessions or we've sent out videos things like that that they have to um, complete before they begin the program and then we cut that down to 20 hours and then they spend two weeks in a program with a one of our um, program coordinators and they go around and coach the staff to get them up to speed as quickly as they can so it's not ideal but it's you know we definitely need people that are trained and we're doing some studies now on whether the people who come in mid-year and receive the shorter training are they how are they performing compared to those who were trained with the full 60 hours in the summer uh, another set of questions, uh, what supports are your staff members given or provided in understanding structural racism and implicit bias? I think that that's something that in our pre-service training, so the 40 hours, 
we do some things around racism and what that looks like to our children because our demographics are that uh, in our schools about 95 percent of the kids we serve are african american and our staff needs to understand the undertones of racism that come throughout the program so we do some serious sort of oversight training around those areas with our staff and then the 20 hours that nicole mentioned throughout the program we do have some um, lessons that are woven into that as well, which can include, we have outside speakers come and talk about those topics as well. Uh, what's, what are the demographics of your staff? Um, I would say it depends on our region. Um, we have programs in Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, and in Charleston. and. Um, we try to make sure that our staff reflects the students we serve, but also bringing in some diversity. Um, we try to recruit students who have all different types of majors in college, and just so they can give our kids a wide view of the world. But the majority of our, our staff looks like the kids that we serve. We do try to have kids see um, adults that look like them as well. Great. And one other question for me, and then I think Ian's got a couple more, and then we'll we'll shift gears. Um, you mentioned uh, that one of the things you learned from the implementation study was that you needed to adjust to meet families' needs. Can you talk a little bit more about what, about that? Give a couple of examples of what you learned. Well, we did um, learn some things around, um, you know, the program being long for kindergartners. Um, there were some surveys done of parents and you know it was that you know that was a very long day for a kindergartner and they can't leave early um, so we did try to break up the day for the kindergarten and first grade students allowing for more free time um, more play time less strict you know that very strict academic time um, so that was one thing that I think came to be from some of the parent surveys that we found um, and then also just the interests of the students helped us change our enrichment block, you know, what they were into. Going back to that earlier question, you know, my, my son can't play basketball if he's in wings. And so reaching out to other partners who could bring those sort of um, enrichment activities into our program, um, I think were some of the two of the major changes we made to our program based on the study. We also learned, you know, obviously parents and teachers have a pretty high focus on homework completion. And so I think through the course of our years, understanding that that's something that, again, both teachers and parents want as a result of the after school program, sometimes that is hard to do because our children, um, some of the homework they're not completing because they don't have the skill set to complete it. And we don't have certified teachers within the program. With, we do have the college students. But understanding that that is a real value add if the children leave the program with their homework complete. Good. Ian, anything else we should cover before we shift gears? Um, there were a set of questions just asking for kind of what does this look like on the ground in terms of, you know, how you train staff on SEL, how you really incorporate those SEL skills into your workplace regularly. And then a second vein of questions was kind of what ongoing coaching and professional opp professional development opportunities are there for for uh, your staff and your college students beyond the, the main training? Yeah, um, just to start, and then I'm going to pass that on the call because she has um, sort of the in-depth knowledge of the training program. But I would say that as an organization, one of the things that really holds us together is the use of the creed. Although we use it in the program with the kids every day, we also see that move up to all levels of our organization. So, you know, it's not uncommon for us to have a staff meeting with our CFO and our HR person and our accounting person and use lines of the creed within it um, or use um, some of the teaching that we do with the children. So, for example, we have um, a line that we use called show what I did. So showing what I did instead of blaming others. And it is not uncommon for someone to come to a staff meeting and instead of saying, sorry, I'm late, there was a lot of traffic, they would say, okay, I'm gonna show what I did. Sorry, I'm late, I didn't leave my house in time, so therefore I got caught in traffic. 
And I think that that's something that permeates through the organizational culture, just the fact that everyone within the organization is able to take hold of what it is we teach and use it not just in the program, but within the culture of the organization. So that is one way that we kind of seep the social and emotional learning throughout the organization as a whole. But um, Nicole can get into a little bit more logistics around the actual training that occurs. Yeah, so I see the question around um, yearly professional development. So we do provide other trainings, other ongoing trainings throughout the year based on um, a program's needs. So if they're struggling with behavior management, then we have a bank of resources that can help them trade, tra train on behavior management. Um, but we also, a big part of working with WINGS is that you have a coach on the ground with you every day. So we expect our program coordinators, their title is actually program coordinator and coach, and they don't spend any time during the program in their office. They are required to be up on their feet, walking around, coaching staff as the program happens. So if you're a college student and you're in a room with kids and you're having a rough time, there's someone right around the corner that can pop in and help you, model something for you, provide feedback afterwards. So a big part of the job is you're almost training on the job that they continue to improve throughout the year. And our second year wings leaders are always so much more prepared due to the year of training they, they had. So um, we do do that ongoing training, but they're really getting trained every day when they come to work with the students. That's great. Um, so let's let's shift over in. Let's shift over into uh, talking about the what next. I mean, you've you you've beaten the odds and come through uh, a random control trial with findings, with positive uh, findings. Um, you've had an implementation study that allows you to get a better understanding of how you can make adjustments to the program and which pieces seem to be most important in terms of really getting to impact. Um, like making sure that your, you know, your quality staff uh, are the key piece of that. Um, so what do you do next? Um, you've moved this into a couple of states. Is your goal to continue to open more WINGS programs? What, what are you going to do next with these, with these positive findings? Yeah, so great question. Um, we found ourselves, uh, from the beginning, we were so focused on the codification of our program and WINGS delivering it that in our early stage, as we replicated, we felt like we had to have control over everything. And then about three years ago, as we started to finish up this randomized control trial, uh, people after the after school field got a lot more interested in social and emotional learning. So it was as if all of a sudden, you know, all the research had come out, people were very interested and they were coming to wing saying, you've been around for such a long time doing this, can we bring wings to our school? And initially our answer was no, because we were so into this, you know, we need to control it and we have a very slow replication and we will, you know, only be able to serve so many schools this way. But then we kind of had an aha moment of, wait a second, we're learning from our RCP kind of the special thoughts that we can put out there. So why would we not want to get wings to as many kids as we can? And there has to be another way to do that as opposed to us running every program. So what we decided to do was find other partners to partner with. So other after school programs or other nonprofits, different programs that have the logistics done. You know, they know how to run a good after school program. They have the activities. They, you know, have the positive youth development going on. But what they want is how do you infuse the social and emotional learning piece? And that's what we really learned from the RCT. This is what our special sauce is. And this is what we can provide partners. So we developed a business plan around developing a partnership model with existing after school programs. And we actually had a pilot project that we launched two years ago with the Pomona Unified School District in California, where we started with four schools there. And then we launched into 21. So we're in all 21 of their Title I elementary schools. And we do the coaching, the curriculum, the training piece for them. And then we support them as they bring the social emotional learning piece. So with them, we focus on the adults and we focus on that culture piece so that they can implicitly bring social and emotional learning in. So I think it's a happy medium for 
us finding what it is that our secret sauce is and finding how we can replicate in a way that isn't so cumbersome as needing to control and run all the program aspects. So we are in, like I said, year two of that, and we're looking to really expand those partnerships over the course of the next couple of years. And, and, and you know, all this information can be found on our website too, just, you know, what, what we've been doing, and there's a case study on the Pomona and all that. That's great. So are you are you thinking that you're going to do this by reaching out to other school districts that already have after school programs in place with a variety of partners and bringing in this kind of consistent uh, adult training? Yes, school districts, other nonprofits, boys and girls clubs, you know, a variety of different types of partners. And Nicole, you will tell you this. Yeah. Nope. Go ahead. I was. I was just going to say, Nicole can walk you through this slide that just came up that goes a little bit farther into what partnering with others looks like. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so we spend, um, with our Pomona project, we did a 21-hour uh, training that really focused around um, the culture and climate and the adult skills and practices. So we spent almost half of our time focused on the five skills and how them at how they as adults could bring those skills into their own life and into their not only their work with students but their work with staff as well and then we also spent the rest of our time focused on our set model how they could support engage and teach kids by modeling those skills so we did that and then we provide um we did six webinars throughout the year that got a little more into components and how they could bring community unity into their already existing program and some best practices around community unity and how to build those bonds with students during that time. Um, so th that's been, you know, a lot of our work with them this first year and then we will work on um, more explicit curriculum um, next year. That will be the plan and assessment. So what happens when you're working with um, an after school program, or let's say you're working with uh, a, perhaps a, a, a national program that already has a lot of programming. It may not be explicitly, they may not have come through it to make sure it, it has all the social emotional elements in it, but, um, but there are branded programs and, and program structures that are already in place that would be, that, that you'd probably get some resistance um, if, if you were to bring sort of the pieces in at the level of specificity that you have. So what's your thinking about how much you've learned that, for example, the creed as the creed is an important thing for every young person to learn and whether the lesson is young people have to have uh, a way in their own language to consistently be able to state and support these, uh, these, these social emotional skills. What's the, what's, the, what's the flexibility there? How do you get flexibility and fidelity? How do you figure that out? Right, and that's what I think we've been spending the last two years trying to figure out. Um, we definitely determined that it really, the what isn't really what we're focused on. So whatever another after school program or nonprofit is focusing on in their program, that's great. What we want to help them do is bring in the how. So how are you teaching that to students? How are you interacting with students? How are you empowering them? How are you teaching them to make decisions and how to um, be self-aware and have confidence in themselves? So we don't wanna be just a, you pull a binder off a shelf and now it's time for SEL. We want it to really be something that's infused throughout the entire organization, which is why we do spend so much time on the adult skills because it shouldn't matter if you're playing soccer with the students or you're doing a reading lesson. You can still bring in social and emotional learning in how you're interacting with that student. Great. So you're, so you're moving this. I, I mean, uh, I know you all know, I think most of the folks uh, listening know that the Weckert Center for Youth Program Quality is uh, a part of the forum uh, for youth investment. Um, and we created it uh, about a decade ago specifically to to push into this uh, question of how you really can bring what we know in that case about program quality and youth development now more specifically about really creating the kind of adult practices that leads to social emotional skill building 
um, in the ways that you're describing, how you really bring that into a set of organizations that have really diverse programming, diverse program content, diverse program structures, um, and lots of different uh, staff coming in. How do you do that? And so this idea of a continuous improvement model focused on um, the adults and focused on bringing in the adults, helping them understand what's important, and then giving them a variety of ways to think about how they can actually um, move that into uh, programming has turned out to be, I, mean, I think as you all know, has turned out to be uh, pretty powerful. So as you're thinking about this and you're thinking about going to scale, are you also looking at partnering with folks who are not so much doing after school programs like schools running after school programs, but partnering with folks that actually have thought about how to do professional development for uh, adults who are working in after school or working in schools and trying to move this in to, the, to their professional development and training systems? Are you, are you thinking creatively in that way as well? We we have done a bit of that of thought around that you know we are our main focus is trying to work with existing after school programs and then we're trying to maybe dabble in some in school work but we have done some just fee based trainings with other programs just around training their adults and we found a lot of success in that in just giving the adults that are working with students in any capacity um, just some knowledge around social emotional learning and have them not be so you know stuck on well it's what do I have to say and what do I have to do and and what are you know the bullets around this you know it really is more about just a mindset and how you can just interact with students in a different way so we have we have done that I wouldn't say that's our main priority but it's definitely an avenue that we are um, exploring okay and I know that you found that uh, sort of you know high quality adult practices are the thing that moves uh, primarily uh, that gets you the measurable student outcomes. Did you learn anything about the, and you, when you go back to the three components, um, are all three of those components in, important to have, for people to have in some combination in their after school program? Um, the, you know, the community unity piece, the, the focus on academics, and then uh, uh, the, the other kinds of uh, extracurricular things that kids can do, is that mixed? Does that turn out to be important as well? Um, I think, you know, we believe that it's important, um, and we also know that certainly schools, if you're running an after-school program in a school, the academics seem to be number one um, in, you know, the principal's mind. So, you know, we we think whatever your priority would be is fine. We do think some type of um, exploration into different things for students, so our, our extracurricular piece might have cooking or sewing or um, any type of sport or um, music, we've done things with a mobile studio where the kids can um, mix their own music. Um, so I think that that is important for students, especially elementary age students, to just explore different things, to just start to figure out more about themselves. And I do Great. say, um, I, I do think that we did probably start the RCT, assuming that those were more important than they were in the sequence of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our model was very much, you go to community unity, then you do a choice time, which is our extracurricular, then you do academic center, and you know, this is how it runs. But I think that our RCT opened our eyes a little bit into that it's not always about the sequence and the structure of the program. It is about the adults that are working there. So we focus on, like Nicole always says, you can bring social and emotional learning into just sitting in the grass in a circle with no supplies, no anything, you can create a social and emotional learning opportunity. It's not as if you need all the structure. So I think that that kind of RCT helps us understand that maybe you don't always need the, all the structure that we have. And we do still run all of our direct service programs in that way, but understanding that there's flexibility as we scale in different ways. I think that's really important um, for, for folks to hear and to emphasize. And, um, you know, RCTs can do a lot of things, but this one, I think, in being coupled with the implementation study and allowing you to get to that conclusion, um, I think will help. Certainly, it seems to have already helped you all. I think it'll help with uh, the replication success um, as you move this forward uh, because you are. Uh, you basically now have evidence that people can be flexible where they're going to naturally want to be flexible on how to really set up that program and what the content mix is. Um, when I think about your three components, they feel a lot like, in some ways, 
uh, the, the folks at Castle, the, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, talk about a three-legged stool. And the fact that we want social emotional learning to, you want there to be some explicit instruction, um, so young people are really getting the language and, and getting an opportunity to focus uh, and practice. Um, you want there to also be an opportunity to have those, the adult embed social emotional teaching and learning and just getting kids to demonstrate the skills in um, whatever the, act the content activities are that they have. Um, and then you also just want it to be a broader part of this climate and culture, which you all are setting up very well. So the, even having um, after school programs think about what their mix is in those three areas and then knowing that you've done very deliberate things to help people bring up adult, the quality of adult practice in all of those areas is important. Uh, it's, a, it's a big message to make sure that even as you're talking about this as uh, a pro program designed for social emotional learning, its success comes from the fact that you moved it not just as explicit instruction, but in all three of those areas, and that you've got things to offer people in all three of those areas. So I think there's some pretty huge lessons out of this that can help uh, that can help the field. Um, I know we're getting to the end of our time. I'm going to turn to Ian to see if any more questions have come in. Yeah, I think you've done a great job of addressing the, the vast majority of the questions, and we, uh, we strongly encourage everyone at the conclusion of today's call, if you'd like more information on the WINGS program, to visit wingsforkids.org. And for those of you who are coming to the national meeting in a couple of weeks, you all will be presenting a workshop uh, at our national meeting, and folks can uh, meet some of your team there in person. Um, We'll give you the last word. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Anything you want to make sure people know um, as they're leaving us? Uh, just thank you, everybody, for uh, joining. And I do, you know, I think that one thing that we really have learned is that, like you said, Karen, just emphasizing flexibility in learning. I think that we've kind of embraced that over the past few years, understanding that we don't have all the answers and that we're learning side by side with everybody else. And I think that it's really important. I don't think people understand, I don't always want to talk about challenges. And I think that what we've learned is it's better to talk about the challenges and put things out there because then everyone can learn from each other. Um, and so, and it's also very exciting that so many people are thinking about social and emotional learning and after school right now. So it's an exciting time. and. We want to be talking with everybody else that's thinking about this, and we're excited. And again, um, thank you, everybody, for listening to us. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, we've learned a lot, um, and uh, you know, I'm sure that folks that download this and listen afterwards, people grab it afterwards uh, from the archive um, and continue to listen. So um, we're glad that we were able to have this conversation with you. Uh, I'll turn it over to Ian for final words. Well. Thank you very much, everyone. Very much appreciate your time and thoughtful uh, comments uh, for the past hour. Uh, it was a great conversation. I don't think I've ever seen more questions on one of these sessions. So, uh, you know, definitely appreciate the thoughtful questions and great conversation. Uh, we are planning a large slate of upcoming thought leader sessions and webinars. We've been a little bit consumed with our Ready by 21 National Meeting that'll be in uh, Palm Beach County, April 18th to the 20th. So at the conclusion of that meeting, we'll be sending out a, a large slate of uh, ongoing engagement opportunities. So please stay tuned for that and sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already. So thank you all and have a wonderful day.